Master Mix time now, and I'm catching up with the legendary mid shortly, a man that had his hand in so many 80s pies that the decade would be unrecognisable without him. New romantic pioneer, co-writer of possibly the most iconic Top of the Pops theme ever, Band-Aid co-writer and co-producer, Live Aid co-organiser, in fact, an all-round absolute legend. Before I catch up with Mitch, let's just remind ourselves of his musical excellence with Ultravox, Solo and a Dash of Visage. On Mitch, your master mix is pure synth heaven and it's coming up next. What an amazing talent he is, our Midge Your Master Mix. Starting off with a couple of Midge solo tracks, If I Was and Call of the Wild. Then we had a few Ultravoxes, White China, Him, Reap the Wild Wind, We Came to Dance, Visage and Mind of a Toy. And then three more Ultravoxes, Dancing with Tears in My Eyes, Love's Great Adventure and, of course, the absolute classic, Vienna. Midge recently wrapped up his Voice and Visions tour, which saw him play to packed venues in the UK, Europe and States. But he's not resting on his laurels. Oh, no. In fact, you can catch him at a number of festivals this summer. And most importantly, he's just announced a special concert at London's Royal Albert Hall, where he'll be celebrating his 70th birthday with us. Plus, Ultravox's iconic 1982 album quartet is getting the deluxe reissue treatment in a variety of formats, and it's out next Friday. The album includes the classic hits Reap the Wild Wind, Visions in Blue, Him, and We Came to Dance. And Midge Your is with us on the show right now. Hello, Midge. Hey, how are you doing? I'm okay. Welcome to the program. I've got to ask you, what are your memories of making quartet? Oh, quartet. George Martin, that's it. I mean, there is nothing else to say. You're working with Sir George Martin was just exceptional. It's every musician's dream to have done something like that. After working with Ultravox, worked with Connie Plank, a very famous German electronic producer for a couple of albums, we decided to kind of shake things up a bit. And who else would we listen to? I mean, we were such morons at times. <laughs> we wouldn't listen to anyone. And of course, when George Martin says something to you, you listen, you know. <laughs> and it was a massively successful record. It was, and it was funny because it was, again, a bit of an experimental record. Um, it, it felt different doing it, um, probably because of how we did it and where we did it and who we did it with. But yeah, uh, it was just sometimes when you're riding on the crest of a wave, uh, you know, things just naturally happen for you. We didn't work too hard at trying to make them hit records. We just tried to write some interesting pieces of music. And the band was incredibly successful. I mean, 16 top 40 hits. Yeah, I know. I've never counted. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it for you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, um, yeah, it was it was very successful. I mean, 
it was a great period. That whole early 80s, you know, early to mid 80s that we were working, we were touring all around the world and, and just having success after success and just doing everything that a musician would want to do, you know, being given enough rope to, to, to see where that would take you, you know, to experiment with music uh, and not have to sit down and think, well, it's got to be three minutes long, you know, to get it on the radio. You just thought, let's make this interesting. And you personally, I mean, you were everywhere in the 80s, weren't you? <laughs> I cloned myself, Gary, what can I say? When someone gives you the, the keys to the toy box, uh, yeah. which is what I've got uh, the late 70s, early 80s, I was just off and running. I was producing other artists. I was, you know, doing visage. I was directing videos for people. I just loved the entire process. If you've got creative juices and you had no other commitments, which I didn't really at the time, uh, you, you just immerse yourself in the joy of being able to make things. Tell us about the now legendary Top of the Pops theme tune, Yellow Pearl. How did that come about? I was a hired gun for Thin Lizzy for a while. I was putting the finishing touches to the first Visage album, and I just joined Ultravox when I, I was in the studio for the last day and I got a telephone call saying, Phil Lynott's going to give you a call in a minute. He's in Arkansas. And I got the phone call saying, can you come out to finish this tour? We're touring, we're opening up for Journey in America. Gary Moore's not in the band anymore. We've got three more weeks to do. And why he called me, I will never know. Uh, And I found myself on Concord the next day, flying out to America for the first time ever. So I thought that was it. I thought I'd do my three weeks there, get back to Ultravox and get on with stuff. But no, uh, Lizzie had other ideas. I ended up doing a tour in Japan with them. Philip wanted to introduce some keyboards to Thin Lizzie, which is a mad idea. Well, they tried out for a proper, you know, replacement guitarist. And yeah. during the sound checks, we used to jam this little da 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 this little thing. Yeah. And Philip called me up about a year later and said, that thing we used to do, can we just try it in the studio? Which we did. And I brought down Billy Curry from Ultrabox, and I brought in Rusty Egan from The Rich Kids and Visage. And we created uh, Yellow Pearl. And then when Top of the Pops, uh, uh, Mark Ortman uh, was in charge of uh, revamping Top of the Pops, he fell in love with the track and asked me to remix it and put drums on it and all of that. And it became the theme for two or three years. It was just incredible. I still think it was the best one. Hey, you've got to say that. That's because I'm on the phone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We have to talk about Band Aid, Live Aid. I mean, what a legacy, what an adventure. It was, and it's weird because originally we we kind of penciled six months, you know, to do all of the stuff that we were trying to do. You know, it was a six month project in our little minds, our tiny minds. And of course, here we are coming up for, you know, nearly 40 years later. It was like being in the vortex of a, a whirlwind, you know, you, yeah. you were just sucked into this thing. And at times you couldn't actually see what the outside world was seeing because you were so embroiled in the entire thing. So it wasn't until a few years later that little girl next door uh, came, came in and she was playing with the dog and stuff like that. And she said, oh, we read about you in history today. <laughs> 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 Excuse me, what, what was that? Um, and that's when you kind of realise just how big this thing actually was. Because it wasn't just a musical event or a musical event. It wasn't just a record. It wasn't just a concert. It was a social event. So it was a massive thing to happen. It feels like everybody was there. Was there anyone on your wish list that actually couldn't make it or you, you wish you'd invited in hindsight? Oh, a few people. I, I think in hindsight, I think both Bob and I were, were friends of Phil Lynott. I mean, why we never asked them to put together Sin Lizzie again to perform there because that would have been, uh, they would have been brilliant at that. Yeah. And I suppose the, the, the other person who should have been there would have been John Lennon. You yeah. know, John Lennon pulled this stuff off a long, long, long time ago. And he was the one who should have been standing on that stage seeing the fruits of his labour. Yeah, absolutely. Was it making your first solo album? It was odd because I didn't tell anyone I was doing it. <laughs> it wasn't an official album until someone said, hey, you've got an album there. I had taken a busman's holiday from Ultravox. We'd been 
constantly writing, recording, touring, and as soon as the tour would finish, we'd go straight back in and write again for the next record and carried on doing that for quite a few years. And I had just built a studio at the bottom of my garden, like you do as a rock star. <laughs> and I was learning how to uh, operate the studio. And I just started recording simplistic pop songs and instrumental music for my first loves and realised that, yes, I've got something that that maybe the record company might be interested in hearing. And of course, they snapped it up. They won't have heard it. So lo and behold, I found myself with a solo record. So the Royal Albert Hall, I guess you played there many times. I have. I've only done it once under my own steam back in the 90s. And I thought those moments would be, you know, well and truly gone. And when my lovely agent suggested last year that I was coming up for a significant birthday, would I like to do something? I said, well, we either go big or we don't go at all. And of course, because of lockdown and COVID and all of that stuff and things being rescheduled and tours being postponed, there were no available dates until about a month ago. Yeah. And all of a sudden, a date came up a few days before my birthday. And we just thought, let's go for it. What better way for a musician to celebrate uh, you know, a moment like that than, than being on stage and, and performing? That's what I do and that's what I've always done. I can't believe you're going to be 70, Midge. I can't even say it. <laughs> the, 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 it will not form, it's, it's, it, the words will not form in my lips. So I've actually called the thing a celebration of seven decades. I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> so what have you got planned for it? Anything you can uh, tell us about the gig that maybe you haven't revealed to anyone else yet? Uh, yes, nothing yet. Um, that's, that's exactly what I've got planned for it. It's all, it's all happened so quickly. Yeah. I'm very weary that what people do when they do a big venue like this is throw the kitchen sink at it. You know, the last time I did it, I had the chieftains on, I had various musicians come out, I had a choir, I had a gospel choir, I had all sorts of stuff going on. Yeah. And I'm kind of weary of doing that. So I'm still formulating exactly what it will consist of. I think as long as I do it well, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. And it's happening on Wednesday, the 4th of October. For sure, it's going to be a super special night. Let's go back to the very beginning. The start of the age, I guess it's probably late 70s too. A nightclub and it's people that changed the face of pop forever. The Blitz. Yes, it's funny because... The Blitz was just called the Blitz because that was the name of the club. It was a regular kind of soul disco type place, but it was taken over. And I, if I remember right, a Thursday night by Rusty Egan, my old drummer from the, the Rich Kids, and his friend Steve Strange. And they just wanted somewhere where all these kids who had been, you know, who had instigated the whole punk new wave movement had moved on because their younger sisters and brothers were starting to like the same bands they liked. And that's the obvious thing is to, to then do something radically different. They wanted to go to a club where they could hear electronic dance music, this music coming out of Europe mainly, and they, where they could dress up in their granny's clothes and wear these fantastic zoot suits and, and look like Hollywood movie stars from the 40s. Yeah. Uh, and that's what, that's what it became. It just became this very, um, not elite, but kind of cool, arty little place. And I think the thing that made it really unique was Steve's door policy. If you turned up at the Blitz not looking really cool, he wouldn't let you in. Yeah. And that, that went for everyone. I mean, there's a famous story about him turning away Mick Jagger because he was too uncool to come into the Blitz. <laughs> but his David Bowie got in straight away. <laughs> what do you think it was about the Blitz that earned it such uh, legendary status? I think every genre of music, every time there's a kind of new revolution in music, you think of certain clubs, you know, in the 90s it would be, you know, Manchester and the Hacienda, in the 60s it would be the Cavern and Liverpool, you know, where new music and, and kids would get together just to hear this music. And of course, the, the clubs associated with it became legendary. And so it was the same in the late 70s, early 80s, that these kids just needed somewhere to go that wasn't high street fashion. It wasn't third generation punk bands. And the Blitz was it. And of course, that attracts the artists. So it was lots of art students and fashion designers and and you know photography students so people who were really into graphic and design and and whatever and they all went to the blitz because they were with like-minded people who were you know potential musicians any given moment you could look around the blitz and not knowing it you were watching you know a future megastar you were looking at a great new film director or a great fashion designer because they were all about to happen 
but you know we weren't aware of that at the time. So we asked you to choose a best of the Blitz My Eighties. We're going to hear your first three now, and then I'm going to come back to you, and you can tell me your ultimate Blitz moment. My Eighties. Hi, Midjur here. The Blitz. Now, there was a little club prior to the Blitz called Billy's, and that's where it all instigated itself. All the cool kids would go there, and my old drummer friend, Rusty Egan, who was still in the Rich Kids with me at the time, he used to find these amazing pieces of music from Europe, you know, Kraftwerk and Le Dusseldorf and Telex. But he also found homemade talents, and none more so than Sheffield's own Human League, who bought a small synthesizer, a tape machine, and decided that they could create an entire record on their own without a big label. And they did. One of the best, best records ever. This is the Human League and Being Boiled. <laughs> Next up, OMD with the electricity. See, it wasn't just music from deepest, darkest Europe that was played down at the Blitz, you know, with Noi and Can and all of that stuff. We had homegrown talent with a lot of musicians looking out with this new technology. They were able to sit and record things that they would never have been allowed to record before. These guys did it from Liverpool, OMD, electricity. I used to stand in for my old friend Rusty Egan when he couldn't DJ, so I would take over the decks. Yeah, can you imagine? And people used to come up to me with new recordings from UK artists, one of which was Gary Newman. And I remember this was a regular occurrence. Uh, new artists were coming up all the time. I remember seeing these guys doing one of the first ever performances in front of a blitz crowd. And that was uh, Spandau Ballet, who went on to do bigger and better things. This is to cut a long story short. Midge, yours, my 80s, best of the blitz. And now, Midge, your ultimate choice. What is it? Well, this is this is me being ridiculously me, 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 uh, selfish. Uh, because I'm you're allowed serious. to be. You're allowed to be, by I, the way. Well, I, I don't want to be, but this actually did make a huge difference. I'm going to choose Visage and Fade to Grey for a few reasons. Visage was put together by Rusty Egan and I without his friend Steve Strange. We wanted to work with a favourite musician, so it was an anti-band. It was like the gorillas before gorillas. You know, we didn't really exist. We only existed in the studio. And it was simply to make music to play in clubs like the Blitz. So there was no aspirations to be big rock stars, no aspirations for a hit record. And of course, Fade to Grey came out and changed all of that. Mid yours, ultimate best of the Blitz memory, Visage and Fade to Grey. And huge thanks to Midge, what a lovely bloke he is. Tickets for Midge celebrating seven decades at the Royal Albert Hall on Wednesday the 4th of October are available now and it is going to be quite the celebration.